This family that I'm going to talk about now are the Percidae, the perch, and this is a unique family. We've got uh, some very large fish and some very small fish, and they're all in the same family. I'd like to give a shout out to Josh Sherwood, who gave me some of the slides for this. Um, so there are 77 Kentucky species, so this is the most numerous family in Kentucky. And like I said, we've got the perch, which are the big fish, and the darters, which are the little fish. So the perch, the big fish, they're a little bit like centrarchids. They have a similar body shape. They have the spinous and soft dorsal fins, but they're not connected. Um, and so in that way, they're a little bit like the, uh, the Moronidae. Um, the little ones are a lot like cyprinids. They're small, but they don't have a forked tail, and they have two dorsal fins. So let's talk about the big ones first. These are easy to identify. You've got the yellow perch, the walleye, and the sauger. Um, you also have the saugai, which is a hybrid of the walleye and the sauger that is stocked sometimes. Um, these are incredibly popular sport fish, especially up north. Here in Kentucky, we're sort of at the southern range of these fish. They're, they're kind of a cool water species, but this is a bread and butter fish up north in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Canada. Um, and they're a great sport fish and they're terrific eating fish. We do have a lot of yellow perch down here in Kentucky Lake. So um, they're going to be larger. They also have a serrated preopercle, which I'll show you in a second. The yellow perch um, is got real obvious vertical bars, some pretty yellow and green coloration, and it does not have any large teeth. The walleye and the sauger um, don't have those bars and they have very obvious large teeth. The way we tell the two apart are saugers have spots and a saddle. So saugers have spots on their dorsal fin and they have what's known as a saddle over their back. I'll show you that here in a second. Walleye have a white spot on their tail. And so that's, those are pretty reliable characteristics. So let's take a look. Here's that serrated preopercle. Um, which in larger fish you actually have to watch out for. Um, it can catch you. And here's a yellow perch and you can see the very obvious uh, vertical bars. Pretty easy fish to identify. Here is your sauger and it's showing um, that splotch on the back which we call the saddle and the spots on the dorsal fins. I do want to point out that this is showing, the picture is showing the old genus name, Stizostedian. But recently, um, I want to say in the early 2000s, give or take, these were all put into the genus Sander. And the thing is, is these are a well-studied, very popular fish. There's tons of literature on them. And the older literature is all going to be represented, or is all going to identify them as Stizostedian. Um, and the newer literature is going to identify them as Sander. So, if you're ever doing any kind of research or looking for papers, you have to remember that. There's going to be a huge decades where it's going to have a different species name. So, Stizostedian is the old genus name. So here's a, an example of the spots on the sauger's dorsal fin. And you see here the walleye dorsal fin does not have those spots. And this is what we're talking about as far as a saddle on the sauger, which the walleye is lacking. And here we see the white spot on the caudal fin. It's on the lower lobe of the caudal fin. And here's another white spot on a nice walleye um, that I caught. Okay, um, so the big ones are easy, the small ones are work, and we've done a lot of these in class already, and you know that these are fish that really are challenging when you're trying to key them out, um, but they're very important fish, and so this is, you know, this is an important skill to have in ichthyology. Um, this is the most numerous group of fish in Kentucky. Um, this group is unique to North America. No other continents have darters. They get their name because they sort of dart or hop around on the bottom. And so um, I've put a link 
on the canvas page, just so you can see this. They do not have swim bladders, they live on the bottom, and they just sort of stand up on their pectoral fins and just kind of hop around, which is why we call them darters. They are really important because a lot of them have a very narrow niche. They're very intolerant, so they're good water quality indicators. Um, they're good indicators of good habitat. If you don't have a lot of darters, you probably have poor water quality or poor habitat. They're important as a link in the food web, um, so they're important prey for larger species, but they're also important to other non-fish species such as mussels. And you'll recall that mussels reproduce by producing what are known as glochidia, which are larval mussels that are released and have to find a fish host and they get inside the buccal cavity and get inside the gills and then they suck on the blood from the gills and they they parasitize the fish gills until they get large enough and then they drop off and then they develop into adult mussels and fish are essential to the reproduction of most mussel species and in fact several mussel species um, have a particular species of fish that they rely upon and so, of course, if you don't have that particular fish, then you don't have that mussel either. So they're uh, an important link in that aquatic um, community. And one of the reasons that there's this close association between darters and mussels is because the darters live on the bottom and hop around on the bottom, which is where you find the mussels too. So they were bound to have some kind of a, a mutualistic or um, symbiotic relationship between the two. And so this is just a general riffle, but where you tend to find darters are in riffles, shallow areas. They can live down in among the rocks. And um, I found several videos on YouTube that demonstrate how the mussels capture darters and when they capture them then they release the glochidia into their mouth and then they let the darter go and this is how they parasitize the darter so um, check those out and you can see how this relationship looks okay so there are so many darters and we don't have that many in the collection and it's really difficult to learn how to identify them just by looking at them. Um, this is a species where you just have to learn how to use your key, or this is a group where you just have to learn how to use your key. But there are a handful of very common ones that I do want you to know because you're going to run into them uh, more often than some of the other darters. So this is just uh, showing some typical darter morphology and you see that they have larger pectoral fins and they, they actually, this is a preserved specimen, but they actually stand like this. They actually kind of use those pectoral fins almost to stand on as they hop around. So there are three genera of darter in Kentucky, but the two most common are the Perkina and the Ethiostoma. And the way we tell between these two is usually to look at the belly. Now, this is not always easy. In breeding males, it's very easy during the breeding season, but other times, and in, in females, it might not be all that easy. One of the things that you look for is this modified enlarged scale that's up on the breast of the fish, and sometimes you have a row of such scales going down the belly. But again, that's easier to see in breeding males. Um, so this can be tough to tell the Perkina from the Ethiostoma, but it's something that you have to practice. Now, within a genus, another characteristic that's very commonly used to identify darters is the presence or absence of a frenum. And you'll remember a frenum is that bridge of skin that connects the upper lip to the nose. And here's an example of an Ethiostoma species that has a frenum. And, and you can clearly see that the groove above the mouth does not, is not continuous. That flap of skin holds that upper lip in place. Now, it's not always easy to position a fish in this way to see this. And so uh, I'm going to show you a couple of short videos I shot showing how to use a probe 
to test for the freedom. And basically you put that probe in the groove and you try to slide it around and try to feel if there's a freedom there or if, the, if it just, or, or if there's no freedom, it'll just slide around. So take a look at these couple short videos kind of demonstrating how to look for this when identifying a darter. So here we're looking at a darter under the dissecting microscope and this darter has a frenum and you can see how I try to drag the probe all the way around in that little groove but I can't do it because there's a bridge of skin on the nose. Now when we zoom in you can see the frenum right there but you might want to take a probe and try and drag it around that groove to make sure that the frenum is there and that upper lip is attached. Now this is a darter that does not have a frenum and again we're under the dissecting scope and as I drag the probe around the groove above the upper lip you can clearly see that there's no bridge of skin right there. There's no freedom. And so this fish does not have a freedom. And this is an easy way to ch identify that. All right, and that's how to identify a freedom. Okay, Ethiostoma is the largest genus of fish in North America, very speciose. A very common darter you're going to run into is the orange throat darter. And here are several examples. And these are most likely males. And this gives you an idea of the beautiful colors that you're going to find in this group of fish. They are stunning. And a lot of people don't even know these fish exist. But if you can get out somewhere that's got clear water and capture males in their breeding colors, they are amazing. So the orange throat darter, a um, few things we're going to look for to identify it. First off, breeding males never have red in their anal fin, right? They've got an orange throat, but their anal fin is always blue. The deepest part of their body is in front of the, dor of the dorsal fin, excuse me. And they don't have many bars posterior to the origin of the anal fin. So the number of bars, the bars are thicker and fewer. Um, one interesting thing about orange throat darters is that they share nests with smallmouth bass. The fry will hatch and move into the nest of a smallmouth bass, and the smallmouth bass won't mess with them. Maybe it's because they're just too small to bother with. Maybe there's a mutualistic interaction there, whereas the, the small darters eat crustaceans that would otherwise prey on the eggs of the smallmouth. Don't know, but that's just an interesting fact. Now, the one that you're going to most likely mistake the orange throat for is the rainbow darter. Now rainbow darters tend to be a little stockier, um, but they have both red and blue in the anal fin on the uh, of the males. And so if you have any kind of color other than blue in the anal fin, it's not an orange throat, it's a rainbow. Their body is deepest underneath the dorsal fin, so a little bit farther back on the fish. And they have more bars posterior to the origin of the anal fin and the bars are smaller. And so here again the top we have an orange throat darter on the bottom we have a rainbow darter and you can see the comparison between the two and um, you can see the color of the anal fin and you can see how the bars are narrower and more numerous in that rainbow darter. Uh, some keys will say the rainbow darter the bars are tilted a little bit but it doesn't look like it in this specimen. Okay, another super common one that's not very colorful is the Johnny Darter. These tend to be a little bit smaller and more slender. Um, one of the common things you look for is X's and W's on the side. And so you don't have very beautiful coloration. You tend to find these, I find these in sandy bottoms a lot. They seem to like the sand, I think. Um, another thing that you look for to tell it between other similar species is that band on the nose is not connected. And so in the one picture you're kind of looking head on, it's not really easy to see, but if you look at the fish head on, that band does not connect. 
the fantail darter, pretty cool, pretty common uh, darter. Um, they call it a fantail because its tail fans out. One of the things I look for is that the front dorsal fin is about half the height of the back dorsal fin. So the entire spinous dorsal fin is very short relative to the soft dorsal fin. Um, you also, especially in males, will see rows of black spots. It kind of looks like stripes maybe, or it almost looks like a solid color because there's so many of them. But when you look, you see, oh wow, that's lots of little dark spots. You can really see the dark spots in this one. And then the other thing that this is, the species is known for is that the males have egg mimics. And so you can see on the, the tips of the spines of the spinous dorsal, you have these bulbs. And here's a real good picture of it. And so they use this presumably to try to attract females because these fish spawn by sticking eggs on the underside of flat rocks. And then the male will sit there and guard them. And so if he extends his dorsal fin and has those egg mimics, it looks like there's more eggs there than what are really there. And that might attract a female. And so presumably that's why these egg mimics have evolved. And uh, here's just another example of that. You can see the dark spots. You can see the egg mimics. They have a thick caudal peduncle, um, kind of a stout looking fish. Uh, they don't have a lot of bright color, but they have really cool color, really cool browns and blacks with kind of an olive tint to it. They're a very neat fish. Um, so this next one that I want you to know is the Harlequin darter. And the Harlequin darter is pretty easy because all the fins except the spinous dorsal have these spots all over them. And so it's really obvious like in the pectoral fins. Now the pectoral fins are huge in this species. This is in a group that has a lot of big pectoral fins, but you really notice it in this fish. Um, also you have a blotch at the end of the tail, which you can really see in the bottom picture here. And this, the like two big blotches that sort of come together and cover the entire base of the caudal fin. Um, and it doesn't have really obvious bars like some of the other darters do. But it's the spots in those fins which is something that really stands out to me. Now this is not a specimen, a species that you need to know. We don't have any in the collection because this is a federally endangered species. But it's one I'd like for you to know about because it's really close to Murray. It's only about 15 minutes west of here in uh, Bayou du Chêne, Jackson Creek, over there in Graves County. This is a very small population of fish. Um, you know, there's a lot of concern because there are not many of them, and it wouldn't take a very big uh, uh, catastrophe to wipe this entire species out. So this is a fish called the relic darter that is something that, um, you know, hopefully we'll get a chance to do some more studies on, and hopefully we can do something to enhance their population because they are so close to us here in Murray. Okay, um, just a couple of examples of fish from the genus Perkina. The other genus, the other large genus in Kentucky, the one you're most likely to run into is the log perch, Perkina caproides, or caproides. Um, that name stands for small perch with a pig's nose, or resembling a pig. And if you look, that's really a characteristic of the log perch, is it has a nose that looks very much like a pig's nose. And in fact, it uses it to root like a pig does. I've got a video of that here in a second. Um, so it's got that long snout with that pig's snout on it that it roots around. Um, it's got tiger stripes, very obvious tiger stripes. It's probably the largest darter you're going to run into. They can get very large. They're, this is a very common darter in the littoral zone of Kentucky Lake. You run into these all the time. They have a little bit of color to them. Um, and uh, if you, I'm going to back up for a second. Um, so when you look at the muscle videos that I've posted on the canvas page, you'll see that there's an example of a log perch rooting around um, and rooting up muscles and, and then getting caught by a muscle. And so you can see how they actually do use this nose like a pig. But this is a very large darter. Uh, another perkina that's pretty common, that's a beautiful fish, is the black sides darter. And this has like blotches on the side, not really bars. And that's something you can kind of key on. This is an interesting darter is that it, it doesn't stay on the bottom. It does come up into the water column quite a bit. 
And here again are some good examples. You can see the the splotches on the side instead of um, vertical bars. Now there are a lot more darter species, obviously, but like I said, these are the ones we have in the collection. These are some more common ones I'd like for you to know. So let me know if you got any questions. And that's it for the perch. All right, thanks.